Welcome back, Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. Really happy to have my friend John Rubino with us uh, once again. John is one of the most frequent guests on this show. Always great to have him. His insights are treasured by our listeners and by yours truly. So uh, really happy to have him with us again. Um, John, of course, is uh, the co-author, along with James Turk, of uh, The Money Bubble and uh, What to Do Before It Pops. And uh, John always has some good ideas. He's also written... Uh, some other books is uh, one is the green tech boom. Um, you might want to ask him picking winners and and uh, picking winners in the green tech boom. And boy, we're certainly talking about the green new deal and all that. Uh, certainly, John must have some opinions on on some of that and what it's uh, you know and how it's playing havoc with our markets. But John, thank you so much for joining us today again. Hey Jay, good to talk to you again. Always good to have you with us. And, you know, I, I passed along this article from Alistair McLeod, Geopolitics, the world is splitting in two. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it or not, but I found it to be a very, very very interesting insights from Alistair. Do you have a chance to look at it? I did. It was interesting. You know, basically, uh, Alistair is, is citing a, a strategist from 100 years ago mm-hmm. who was predicting at the time a lot of what's happening right now which is to say that, uh, you know, it's in Russia's strategic interest to uh, expand its sphere of influence to the countries around it. And that is basically a fulcrum that will you that will allow them to control a big part of the world in theory. Mm -hmm. A lot of what's happening today uh, kind of looks like that. Mm -hmm. Although I I would say that um, instead of it being some grand theory, that Russia has been pursuing for all these decades and is now being implement, implemented by Vladimir Putin, that it's more a, um, a problem with the stupidity of U.S. policy that mm-hmm. is forcing a lot of countries to do what they're doing, you know, because we've, we've had the world's reserve currency mm-hmm. since World War II, and we could have used that power, the power that comes with having the money that everybody wants and that you can create out of thin air, we could have used that for good. And instead, we used it to basically bully a lot of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, if anybody steps out of line now from uh, the the dictates of the U.S. global military empire, we threaten to kick them out of the monetary system. Mm -hmm. Uh, In other words, we use the dollar to uh, diminish their power and increase ours. And naturally, that kind of grates on Russia, China, India, you know, other other countries who are um, by virtue of, uh, of you know, their, their position in the world or their population or, or other capabilities who, who feel like they should have some power, too. You know, and and so it shouldn't be a surprise to us based on how we have behaved in the U.S. Um, that these other countries are now in effect, setting up a completely parallel global financial system to compete with the dollar-based global financial system. And it's pretty formidable. You know, you combine Russia, China, and India, and you've got a lot of um, financial power there with which to set up separate trade um, relationships and, uh, you know, for instance, create a currency that is a basket of those other currencies, then back it with gold and have it compete with the dollar. You know, those things are all possible. And our behavior, the U.S.'s behavior is accelerating the process of this new gigantic financial and possibly military union that's emerging out there right now. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that, um, we could have used the dollar for more constructive means, but uh, Eisenhower warned us back when he was leaving office of the military-industrial complex, and I think he foresaw the profit motives in war as a threat to our country and its um, and, and the things that we believed in and held dear in terms of personal freedom and the like. And um, it, it, you know, if you just look at what's going on now in the Ukraine, it's it's a stalemate, really. It's a stalemate, but there's no there's no desire, it seems, to have uh, to to have some sort of a stalemate or some sort of a peace arrangement because we just keep hearing about how we're sending another several hundred billion dollars worth of weapons over to uh, to Zelensky, and of course, who's who's providing those weapons? Well, it's mostly our arms dealers, I suppose. Uh, but in any event, Alistair makes the point that Putin wants America out of Europe. 
he sees us as a as a thorn in his side, essentially. And uh, he wants the U.S. out. Uh, and, of course, if you go back to the fall of the Soviet Union, it's in writing, we promised the Soviet Union when they put down their arms that we wouldn't take one inch of new we wouldn't expand NATO one inch. I think Secretary of Baker wrote, it's in writing. And we promised Russia we wouldn't do that. Well, what, what, what have we done since then? We've taken every Eastern European country virtually, and now it was just a bridge too, too far crossed, I guess you might say, when we decided that we wanted to, or at least talk, started talking about adding the Ukraine into NATO. And I think that was the breaking point for Putin. He said, that's enough. We can't let this go any further. Is that your read of it, John? Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, Russia has been saying all along, look, we need defensible borders. We, we can't have a hostile military alliance right on our borders, you know, just, just like um, the U.S. in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm-hmm. The Soviet Union at the time tried to basically incorporate um, Cuba <laughs> into its military alliance, and we were ready to fight World War III over that. So Russia is now in the position of having to decide what to do about an encroaching uh, military alliance. And they, they finally, um, you know, they finally decided to go for it. And they, they invaded Ukraine. Uh, and the U.S., I, I, we kind of see that. I think our policymakers see this as a way of draining Russia's um, resources and weakening them. But that's not how it's turning out um, because... Uh, we've sanctioned Russia and, and uh, tried to stop them from selling oil overseas. And, and basically what it means is we don't get the oil and Europe doesn't get the oil and the gas, but the rest of the world still does. Those things are fungible. You can sell them to anybody. And uh, so Russia's making a lot of money on this. Mm-hmm. Their, their finances are actually improving, which means they don't have any real incentive to uh, to cut a deal with Ukraine. And we're, uh, you know, NATO is telling Ukraine not to settle. So, that's why things haven't settled so far. Neither side really feels like um, it's in their interest to cut a deal and get this thing over with. And the longer it goes on, the more money Russia is making by selling its oil. And the weaker Europe becomes by being deprived of Re- Russian natural gas. You know, Europe, I think, is the story here. You I do, too. Russia and China off to the side for a while. Look what's happening in, in Germany and France and Italy. Uh, those guys made themselves dependent on Russian natural gas. And then they proceeded to antagonize and sanction Russia, you know, thinking, I don't know what they were thinking. I mean, they must have assumed that they'd still get the natural gas, but they're not. And, um, well, among other things, what's happening in Europe now is that the price of electricity is up by like 10 times. I know. In this time last year. And a lot of industries that require a lot of electricity, for instance, aluminum smelting are looking at having to shut down, um, which means they're going to be, um, well, it means today's messed up supply chains are going to get much more messed up going forward. And, and meanwhile, in Germany, they're, they're literally telling people, well, you know, if you can't heat your house in this winter, maybe you should look and see if there's some firewood around. Mm-hmm. Or you know, instead of taking a shower, wipe yourself off with a wet rag. <laughs> They're telling their people stuff like that. And this is Germany, you know, arguably the, uh, the richest society in the world right now. Uh, and so they're looking at a, a tremendously complex, painful six months or so as they go into the winter here, um, where, the, where there could be civil unrest, there could be extreme political instability, and there's definitely going to be a recession. Um, so, you know, to the extent that the global economy depends on a healthy Europe um, for, to produce things and to buy things, uh, it's not going to be the case going forward for a while. And this hurts us in the um, NATO-US-Europe um, alliance. And it, it doesn't really hurt Russia and China all that much at all. So it, it, it looks like the longer this goes on, the more the balance of power shifts towards Russia, uh, to an extent towards China and possibly towards India. So those guys get richer while we get poorer, unless we do something radical to stop the whole thing. You know, John, you mentioned uh, firewood, and I, I can't remember which country it was. It was a lesser country in Europe that is banning exports of firewood now mm-hmm. because they want to have it for themselves. But, you know, uh, it, to poke Putin in the eyes with a, with a couple of sticks, we also have 
uh, we're trying to annex uh, Sweden and Finland, I guess it is, into the into NATO as well, and other countries that border Russia. So it doesn't seem as though we're interested very much in peace, and I would suggest that there's an awful lot of money to be made by having to, by having enemies. It seems to be that's that's what's going on. But John, you mentioned um, we're doing our part. We're doing our part. We're paying more money now for natural gas. It hasn't hit us too hard in the U.S. yet. But natural gas has gone from $2 to $10 or something like that. Now, this morning, it hit a new high in North America, over $10. Uh, and that's largely because, as I understand it, at least in part, it has to do with, I think in large part, to do with the fact that we are creating LNG, liquid, liquefied natural gas, and exporting it to Europe to try to offset what Putin isn't providing. And, of course, the winter is coming when there's going to be an even greater need to heat homes in, in Europe. Uh, so I think you you know what you say what you said is right. The longer this goes, the more it seems to play into Putin's hands. But there seems to be an a, a sort of an arrogant attitude on the part of the West that, or the United States at least, that we can continue to create money out of thin air. We can do it forever. We have the dollar, the almighty dollar. It is the world's currency, reserve currency. There's no way that's ever going to end in the minds of most people. Uh, even though what you're talking about there. There certainly are thoughts of, of replacing the dollar from our adversaries, um, but you know what? Do you, this is going to push up. This is, I would say, already is pushing up our costs, uh, or will do a lot more in the winter. I mean, we haven't seen our electricity prices here in New York City go up very much. It's gone up some, uh, uh, but not nothing like tenfold. But it's gone up maybe twenty or thirty percent, something like that, so far. But winter, when winter comes, and these things sort of take a little time. Uh, before they're priced into the uh, electricity costs, um, it just seems to me that this is this is not a good game we're playing, and I, d I don't know why um, you know why they can't see what we're talking about, why the policymakers don't see it, what's keeping them from understanding this. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Jay, a minute ago when you said um, the military industrial complex is making money from this. So to yeah. those guys, this isn't so bad because their uh, uh, their income statements are all pointing in the right direction. They're all making a lot of money by, uh, for instance, selling a lot more arms to Ukraine and uh, and financing uh, an expansion of NATO, things like that. That that makes money for the arms. Um, manufacturers who finance a lot of political campaigns. So it's, it's not unlike what happened in public health just lately, <laughs> where we did a lot of irrational things um, because it enriched some very big, very powerful com companies who mm -hmm. were the financiers of a lot of political campaigns. So if you look, if you follow the money and you look at who profits, it's not as crazy as it seems. There, there are actual beneficiaries with a lot of power um, for today's policies. So that, that could be just the explanation right there. You know, these guys aren't crazy. They're not incredibly incompetent. They're actually pursuing their own profits as they see it, and they're succeeding brilliantly so far. Yeah, it would sure, it would sure seem that that's the case. You know, uh, speaking of military conflicts, we might not have to go so far away. I understand that Russia is running some military exercises with Venezuela now. So, you know, maybe uh, maybe the boys are licking their chops for some war closer home. I, I hope not. But, um, you know, one can only – now, here's the thing, John. We have this situation where energy prices are going up. Uh, people are having – you know, we're in a recession, or arguably, or we soon will be. And inflation is eating away at the living standards of average people moving them out of their homes into homeless situations in some cases. It's, it's a dire situation for many millions of Americans. But who cares, right? What's the big deal? The government can always print money and send us checks, right? Isn't that mm -hmm. what's going to happen? Yeah. We're going to have Uncle Joe is going to send us all checks if we need, if, you know, if our incomes are below a certain level, we can just put our hands out and collect the money, and there's no problem at all. Yeah. Well, if you want to talk about long term nefarious plans, this kind of looks like one where they make us more and more dependent on mm -hmm. government aid. And because we're, we're dependent, we become more and more easy to push around and control. Right. So, yeah, the next big recession, the next energy crisis, the, the next whatever, the next pandemic, whatever, um, 
is going to increase government power over regular people by making us dependent on them one way or another with the ultimate goal of us being always dependent. You know, it won't just be crisis specific pretty soon. It'll just be our natural existence, um, you know, in which we depend on that monthly check from the government. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And because of that, we basically have to do what we're told, you know, and, and there, there's still time to turn away from that, but we are really headed in that way at, a, at an accelerating rate. And, and hopefully uh, people start to see that and they respond politically and um, however else, you know, they, they can vote with their pocketbooks, they can work politically uh, and they can hit the streets. And uh, that's happening all around the world. We're seeing civil unrest in many different places right now because of, um, uh, of inflation and unemployment and geopolitics. And hopefully that kind of pressure turns the world's governments away from this, this strange, disturbing grab for power that they're all involved in right now. But uh, I wouldn't be too optimistic about that just based on their success so far. Yeah. Well, they will own nothing and they will be happy, Klaus Schwab said of the World Economic Forum, and that may be what they have in mind for us. But those of us who don't want to succumb to that kind of, uh, that kind of a lifestyle, uh, what suggestions do you have for them? Well, um, th- there's very little you can do right now with your vote. I mean, we should participate in politics, but uh, as far as the, the coming financial crisis goes, at least, we can't stop that. You know, the uh, the world's fiat currencies are going to evaporate at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that at least is something you can protect yourself from. You know, you do that by moving out of financial assets. You know, get rid of your government bond funds and hold um, only the cash that you need to pay your bills with and move the rest of the money into real assets. That is well-chosen real estate, farmland, energy assets, precious metals, you know, precious metals miners. The uh, the gold and silver miners you cover in your newsletter are probably going to be big beneficiaries of the currency crisis that's coming. So those are the kinds of things you can, uh, you can do with your finances that protect you at least to an extent from what's coming. You know, the political stuff, that's tougher. But uh, financially, at least, we have a lot of things we can do as individuals. And... Uh, that that's, that's about yeah, it. I, I find that really psychologically helpful because as long as you're doing something, you know, mm-hmm. you, you're mm-hmm. able to keep going. And, and uh, there, you know, by accumulating a lot of gold and silver, you're definitely doing something to help yourself financially going forward. Right. You um, you just have to. You, you're never going to have complete control, but you do what you can. Uh, what what makes sense in terms of your own finances, uh, taking care of your family and your loved ones, those around you, as best you can. And then the rest we have to leave in the hands, uh, for sure, everything in the hands of the Almighty, as far as I'm concerned. Well, John, thank you so much. We're going to talk to Brian London now about uh, waiting for the turn, the turn in gold, and gold is up a little bit today. Uh, do you think we might be You think we might be getting there, John? Well, yeah, I think there's a good chance of it uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that seasonality is a big deal in precious metals, and we're heading, yeah. into the, we're heading out of the doldrums and into the better um, – seasonal time for gold and silver. So normally, right. September, October, November, December, those are good months for, for precious metals. So that's coming. Uh, the other is that uh, we're, we're getting closer to the Fed's capitulation in this cycle. In other words, they're raising interest rates, tightening a little tiny bit. It's affecting the economy. The economy's rolling over, especially, you know, housing is tanking. We didn't have a chance to talk about that, but mm-hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's going to slow the economy way down. The Fed at some point will stop tightening, go back to easing, and that's always great news for precious metals. So um, because of those two things, you know, we could have good seasonality, then the Fed capitulation might buy us a whole year of rocking financial or rocking precious metals prices. And the miners, of course, we hope. All right, John. We'll have to keep it going. Yeah. yeah. Miners will do even better than precious metals themselves. That tends to be the case when we're in a bull market. All right. Thank you so much, John, for being with us. Always appreciate it. 